Muted. Blue Adler, uh, I'm reading your challenges and what I find interesting because I've been around so many years is the challenges there there many of them are very very comparable to the what 20 30 years ago when I started as a recruiter uh, and I only recruited passive candidates today the challenge is a little bit different I kind of want to address them all uh, well you, you, some of them are pretty good challenges so let's kind of describe them I'm going to try to JJ, you have to pay specific attention to the challenges and folks on the call, if I get to a specific topic where you think it's related to your challenge, please hi say it again, type it in the chat again, because I obviously won't remember all of these as we're going here. I uh, want to talk about recruiting at the top of the funnel, but we'll talk about recruiting throughout the recruiting funnel as well, and I think some are at the top, some in the middle, some are at the end, uh, so we'll try to address all of those. Uh, if you have any questions that are not answered uh, or you have certain questions about what we do, info at Lou Adler Group is a great way to do it. We will have a handout. I know JJ will, in fact, send a um, questionnaire or some email after this. I don't know if we actually send the link to the handout, but if we forget, go to louadlergroup.com and contact us and say, hey, I want the handout, then we'll get you the handout. But, uh, I know we have to have you registered, but I guess you can't be listening to this unless you're registered. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about passive candidates. Uh, there's a lot of interactivity. We give away free bonuses and some free training, so pay, uh, free demos, so be aware of that as we pay attention. And if you actually stump me on a question, I've never been stumped before, so, but if you actually do stump me, I'll give you a signed book. <laughs> it didn't worth that much. It's actually worth, the book is worth a tremendous amount. Signed book is worth about a buck and a half. Unsigned, you'll still can return it to Amazon and get fifteen dollars for it. But nonetheless, I'll be happy to sign a book for you. Uh, when I go out to clients, and many of you know, I, I, I we we join forces with third-party recruiters. Uh, we have some that are certified performance-based hiring partners, and we make the and we our our focus on it is to train companies and hiring managers and recruiters in the methodology of performance-based hiring. The recruiter, our recruiter partners do fulfillment. And if you're interested in becoming a re re uh, recruiting partner with us, uh, feel free to info at louadlergroup.com. But the case that I make is that using performance-based hiring at every step in the methodology or the hiring process, you'll actually be able to reach what I call the hiring super perfecta, which I call Q. Uh, this is the point where quality is in the top 25%. Time to fill and cost are as low as possible or as low as needed. Time is definitely short because that's critical cost. will be lower than, generally speaking, certainly reasonable. It won't, won't have a business impact on you. Uh, more important, candidate quality not only high, but candidate satisfaction high, and interviewing accuracy is close to perfect. You will know exactly how well this person will do in your environment. That's the promise. Uh, which I, and I make this interesting statement is that's not, we get there all the time. I was with a couple, about 50, 60 hiring men in the last two weeks. We've been there all the time. Every time you promote someone, you're there. It's not unusual. I mean, you might promote someone you don't think is any good, so you promote them because of uh, need. But when you promote someone, they're, you kind of know if they're going to be good. You work with a person two to three years or six months or a year. When you get a high quality referral, you're pretty close. It might not get the person in a day or two, but you might get the person in a week or two. Uh, high quality, not a lot of cost. You hire, rehire people, happens all the time. You rehire people because you know they're good and you can make it happen quickly, they're in your network. Uh, it tends to happen when you know someone. Uh, Q is less likely when the person is less known. People who are total strangers, it becomes kind of strange here. And it's, what's interesting is when people are strangers, we change the whole focus of how we interview people. We shift to a skills-based process rather than a performance-based process. So our whole focus when we go into companies is, hey, we're going to use a performance-based process. So I did this last week, a uh, couple of, and you might have seen this. I, I think I've shown it on a neat uh, post or a couple of posts. I've put this chart in here. But I just asked, and this has all happened the last two weeks, so I just said, think about interviewing accuracy. When you know someone, is interviewing accuracy high or low? I mean, you know the person, so you might promote someone who's clearly a risk, but you still, it's a high interview accuracy. What about a high quality referral? Pretty high, it's higher, but it's probably less than a known acquaintance, a few unknowns. 
When you hire strangers, though, it's problematic if they're going to fit. There's just too many variables. But you look at that curve. When you hire strangers, the accuracy of the interview drops off. We all use behavioral interviewing. We use these assessment tests. We don't use behavioral interviewing with acquaintances or referrals. And the accuracy is higher. So you start thinking about why does this happen? Well, when you start thinking about why it happens, and this X should be, well, it doesn't matter. The X is, uh, excuse me, guys. I'm sorry. I was trying to move that X to where it's supposed to be, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is we have this gap there. Uh, and it's because when we know somebody, we focus on their performance doing comparable work in the environment we know. We know a lot about the person. When we don't know someone, we start focusing on their skills and experience before they can even get the game. Then we qualify on their salary and location of company. So we do all this silly kind of stuff with people we don't know. And I'm going to contend when you're going after passive candidates, you can't do any of that silly stuff. It's a different game. And that's what I want to kind of talk about today is understanding, hey, how do we get Q, how do we do it with passive candidates, and how do we kind of look at the world of recruiting in a totally different fashion? It's almost redesigning the recruiting process. So now I want to kind of, uh, I don't know if you guys were there. Some of you might have actually been at a greenhouse uh, customer event. It happened, I think it was the first week in June or the last week in May in San Francisco, 700, 800 people there. And Dan, the CEO, opened up the, uh, the meeting. Uh, greenhouse and ATS, and very good one too, but neither here nor there, opened up the ATS and said since they've been around, they've processed 13 million applications and made 112,000 hires on their system. I look at that, and people clap that they could process that much information, so, and they do it very efficiently. I looked at it and said, that's 1%. 1% of the people who actually apply get hired, but it gets worse. When you, and I start digging into numbers with them and some other things. So how it gets worse is 130 million people minimum actually looked at those 13 million applications. So only at most 10% applied. But it even gets worse than that because of the 112,000 people that were hired, 15% actually applied directly was their primary means of getting in. 45% were direct source, meaning they went out, some recruiter went out and tried to find them and hire them, and 40% were referrals. Uh, that's very similar to, I, I think, the experiences you folks have had and certainly the research we've done with LinkedIn and our own surveys. Uh, so the question I ask people when I show this chart, I says, and you guys could answer this as well, and you'll see where I'm going here from a passive candidate perspective. Does the quality of people you naturally attract just through your branding and employee, and some of you have a great employee brand, you attract better people, but just the people who naturally attract your company without doing a lot of work represent the best people in the field? Very important question. So I'd just like you to say yes or no. Does the people you naturally attract represent the best people in the field? You're looking for engineers, marketing people, salespeople. Is your company known uh, to just attract the best people? Just answer yes or no. Or sometimes, it doesn't matter. You can and say it to everybody. Yeah, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And generally speaking, if you have a great employer brand, it works. Um, but you still have to, even if you track them, I mean, uh, we gave a webcast a couple of days after I did this thing with the Greenhouse, or actually I think it was the day afterwards I was there. Airbnb, because I was in San Francisco, was headquartered there. They get 30,000 applications a month. 30,000 a month. And they hire 50 people. So they might get the best people. There's a lot of work separating uh, the good from the bad. So you start thinking about what's actually happening in the world of recruiting. To get to the top 25%, even if you have a great employer brand, you get a lot of people you don't want to hire. So the focus of your whole process is weeding out the weak ones that hopefully the good ones remain. If you're not attracting the best, then you're just wasting your time weeding out uh, and hopefully you get a few good ones left. So you start thinking about how much effort is put into, even if you've got a great employer brand, you're still not necessarily hiring better people uh, than you currently have. You're spending a lot of time uh, being efficient, not improving quality. So now I want to kind of talk about the funnel. The approach that I recommend is fundamentally different. I don't want a lot of people. I want to identify 15 to 20 or 30 people at most for any project and rec identify them on LinkedIn, whatever tool I'm going to use, uh, identify the people, and then ensure I can get in contact with them. My goal is to get 80 to 85% response rate so I can talk to people. 
to me, that's the hard thing, is getting, not, I don't want 3 to 5% response. I want 80% response. I got to get these people to talk to me, and I get them through referrals, direct sourcing, campaign marketing. And that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, and this is what I tell people, to get to Q, that's the promise of performance-based hiring, is we're going to get to Q by less is more, less sourcing, more creative sourcing to find people who would see our job as a crew move, get them in a phone conversation, and then recruit the heck out of them. So that's the goal we have here. Uh, the quick background, which I give, you might have heard this. I know Jake has probably heard it a hundred times because I see his name on just about every one of our training courses we have. But I've been a recruiter for a lot of years, 20 years. No, I guess not. Say 15 years when I wrote this book, Hire With Your Head. Uh, took a couple years to get published, but I wrote it uh, after doing recruiting for 15 years. My background prior to that, I was in engineering, process controls, manufacturing, supply chain, uh, cost accounting, financial planning, and had a pretty nice career, but I just decided recruiters had a better life than I did, so decided to check it all and become a recruiter. Very quickly realized that there was a business process to recruiting, and very quickly had plenty of clients because I knew a lot of people in the area. Uh, after a couple of years, uh, put a couple of audio tapes together with Nightingale Conant, I uh, wrote the, I would call the fourth edition of Hire With Your Head. Didn't go with Wiley, uh, so I changed the name, The Essential Guide for Hiring and Getting Hired, uh, which also gives candidates insight what to do if your hiring manager or recruiter aren't doing the right things. But fundamentally, it became a business process for hiring uh, with a focus on, hey, if you do all these four things, uh, you will actually hire great people every time, the top 25%. But the focus is not weeding out the weak, it's hiring the best, identifying them and recruiting the heck out of them. Uh, but you had to work through the top of the funnel, and that's what I want to talk about today, getting them in the funnel and working them step by step throughout the funnel. Uh, and I want to kind of get very quickly to the tactics of how you do it and answer some of your questions. And I actually prefer to deal with some of your questions. And once I present this, I'll go back and see if I can find a couple of uh, interesting challenges. And JJ, if you want to cut and paste some challenges in there you think are relevant and relevant to everybody, feel free to do it in the chat area. When we go into a company, the first thing we look at is their just their underlying hiring strategy. And they all want to reach Q. But I basically say the problem with getting to Q is that 95% of companies we deal with, even those that have a good employer brand, have a hiring process that's designed fundamentally backwards. Uh, here's what I mean. So we look, we do a quick audit. So let me just ask you this. Uh, for your jobs that are your most critical positions, is there a surplus of the best people or is there a scarcity? I mean, if you've got such a great brand, you are attracting A-level talent, then your answer is surplus. If in your position you're not attracting the best people, uh, you're in a scarcity situation or there's a high demand for these people, you're in scarcity. So what are you in this, is your situation for your most critical positions, you have surplus or your scarcity? Okay, surplus. Jake, what kind of positions do you fill? <clears throat> you don't need this class, Jake, if you've got a scarcity, I mean a surplus. So everybody so far other than Jake, <clears throat> I'm actually Jake, I'm so choked up, I can't, nobody's ever said that. So we got most everybody says scarcity. So here's the problem. When you think about how ATS is designed, even good ones, but think about how your hiring process is designed, how you take a job, uh, you know, how you take a, when you open up a new rec. It starts with the hiring manager puts together a job description with a list of skills and experiences. It's what the person needs to have. The candidate on his or her resume puts all the stuff that they have. We then have a bunch of people who, uh, there are a bunch of systems who determine, hey, to get in the game, you have to have what we uh, want. And there's a lot of mixing and matching and some very sophisticated artificial intelligence doing a better and better job of matching that. In my mind, it's fundamentally, who cares? It's the wrong way to do it. However, that's the way a process goes from left to right. The second box is the getting. I'm doing a couple of searches right now with a couple of recruiting partners and candidates. And I think, and this is one question I will ask, is candidates always ask, uh, what's the comp? You guys, uh, Jack, sorry, Jake. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. That. I've seen you a hundred times there, and I've called you Jake for a hundred times, so probably still will. Uh, neither here nor there. 
when you get a candidate on the phone, and we're doing it right now, we're talking to passive candidates right now. First question, what's the comp, what's the location, what's the salary? They all want to know what they get. And we already know that these people are good, but even people who you look are good, it's the first question. We, all, we negotiate the job, the title, everything before we even have a conversation about the job and title. It's like you can't go to a department store or you can't even look on Amazon at stuff that you can't afford. No, you can't see this product because you don't have enough money in a budget. Your credit card is maxed out. Whatever it is, it's silly. But that's the way we do it, having and getting. The next step is if you actually do get past that, your salary ranges are right, locations right, you have a conversation about, you box check the person's skills, but then you start having a discussion about the doing, what the actual job really is. And if you ask a candidate, why they took a job, a passive candidate, they'll say it's because I want to do this work and I can see what I can become. But we eliminate so many people who can actually do that work before we even get to the conversation about that work because we have a surplus mentality. We weed out the weak based on stuff that doesn't matter. What matters is can a person do this work? And I make the statement, if the person can do the work, they have exactly the skills they need. How can they do the work otherwise? And some people need a lot more skills or a lot more years of experience and some people, the high potential people, need less. So we lose out all the high potential people who can do five years worth of work with two years experience. I mean, who would want to lose those people? Who would want to lose a person who could do, get five years work of work done and two years experience? Everybody who got promoted is in that category. Everybody gets assigned a bigger project quickly because they're, they can handle bigger projects, gets those assignments and you exclude them out because you're using criteria that doesn't predict performance. So now, so our whole focus is a scarcity approach. Let's advertise what people can do and become. Let's get them excited about it. Now, this requires a couple of shifts. When you talk to the hiring manager, you've got to get the hiring manager to find the work as a series of performance objectives. When you talk to a candidate, you've got to get the candidate off this idea of what they get. So somebody asked me the question, how do you deal with compensation? I don't know who it was, but if you can put your name in real quickly, I'll just use this as a role play. I'm not going to pick, make you talk. But uh, somebody said, well, let me ask everybody. If you ever have a problem when talking with someone about compensation, where they, your compensation budget isn't high enough to attract the person, and you immediately shift into trying to get a network, but ever have that problem? Yes or no? I mean, that's why. So Lily said it first. So let's assume I call Lily up. I'm, I'm approaching Lily. I find her name on LinkedIn. She looks like a great candidate. I send a series of emails. She responds. But the first question is, Lily, the, the email sounded good, but before we get serious, what's the compensation? But before I actually, Lily, could say that, I opened up with this comment. I said, Lily, if the situation I'm involved with made clear career sense, would you be at least open to discuss it for five or ten minutes? So Lily says, yes, but what's the compensation? Which pretty much happens. But here's what I said. Lily, it really doesn't matter uh, what we pay you if this job doesn't re represent a career move. Let's first see if it represents a career move, then we'll see if the pay can work. Because it doesn't represent career move, let's, and that'll only take five or ten minutes. That's how you put compensation in the parking lot. I'm going to mention that again, uh, give you some other ideas on how to recruit at the top of the funnel, but that's how you get compensation in the parking lot at the top of the funnel. Get, and I'm going to actually say the first five minutes of your first phone call is absolutely critical to recruiting passive candidates. Whoever talks to that passive candidate first is the tipping point. The other tipping point is getting I've only identified 20 to 25 people. I'm, I got to get 80% of those people to call me. So that's the other. You get those two things right, you're in the game. Recruiting is really not hard. If you know what the person's got to do, what people have to become, what's hard now is since everybody has LinkedIn, nobody wants to talk to you. But if you get them to talk to you, there are some recruiting skills you need to know. But getting to talk to you is, to me, is the hardest part. Well, I get I get people on the phone. I can recruit them or I can network with them. Getting to talk to me is, uh, and I got to be pretty creative doing that. So, but here's the fundamental. Uh, concept that I basically say. You can't use a talent surplus process when a talent surplus doesn't exist. And so many companies do it. So fundamentally, if I just had to say the fundamental rule is, hey, if you're in a surplus situation or a scarcity situation, you can't use a surplus process. You've got to use a left to a right to left process, not a left to right. And if you and I if you look at your job descriptions. And if your job descriptions emphasize skills, experiences, you have the wrong process. If they emphasize what the person can do and become, and it's a challenging title and it's exciting, you have the right process. And if your hiring manager willing to talk to people who can do the work but have less skills, you have the right process. 
So that's what I want to talk about today. So this is fundamental. You will not hire a single passive candidate. That's not true. The only passive candidates you'll be able to hire if you use a left to right process are those who, have, who are top performers, who have an economic need to apply, or something happened with their company. We're doing one search for a, uh, a lead generation director. Uh, talked to the recruiter last night. He was telling me, he said, I found this right, this one guy, his company uh, just moved, I don't know where they moved, but they moved from over there, the northeast down to, I think, the southwest. He didn't want, he got an offer, didn't want to go with him, so now he's looking. He looks like an A-level candidate. We just lucked out in finding him. I do know we have to move fast, though, but that was a high, not, he's probably not a passive candidate. He just actually, we asked him, how long have you been looking? He said, Monday. So we just purely lucked out to some degree of finding them, but now I'm telling my client, we got to move quickly with this guy. We got a great candidate. Unfortunately, he's the first candidate we found, but nonetheless, that, we got to move fast. Uh, but those are the things that happen when you're in the recruiting business. Uh, so here's performance-based hiring in a nutshell. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I don't want to get into details. After about five or six years in the recruiting business, I had two other people working with me, and we created our own firm. We really looked at, we had about 70 or 80 people who were clearly top 10, top 15 percent. There was no question. They got promoted. They started using us, high standards. We started benchmarking. Now we had 80 or 90 people. We said, okay, what was the circumstance? How did we get these people hired? What was the circumstances? And eventually, by benchmarking these people and then refining it over 10 years, it became the performance-based hiring business process. We didn't call it that initially. I don't know what we called it initially, but we definitely benchmarked best practices. Uh, and it was an expert system, meaning we benchmark what the best people did. Other ways of doing it, a great employer brand that attracts the top 5 or 10 percent is another way to do it, but uh, our clients never had, they didn't need to pay recruiters. <laughs> they, so we never had companies with best employer brands. They just had high standards of performance. Uh, but this is what it became. If you want to hire a great person, every single one, it was a great career job for them. That was the number one. It was a career. What they could do and become was very clear. So when we started taking assignment with managers, hey, what does this person can do? What can need to become? That's, and we ask manager, hey, let's put the skills-based job description in the parking lot. What does the person need to do and become? The best people, I mean, we made 1,500 placements in about uh, 15, 17 years. I don't think maybe 5% applied to a post. It wasn't a job post. It was a, a, an ad in the paper or somewhere. I don't even know if we did those. But there were all referrals and direct sourcing. We just found names, we figured anyway, we had breaked out companies and started calling people, but direct sourcing and referrals. And we had to convince them that it wasn't about the money, it was about the career move. Pretty true today, although how you get these people is different. We also, I don't know if you guys have this problem, but, and I know we have some hiring managers here, but I'll ask hiring managers and recruiters and anybody else who's on the interviewing team, has anyone who has a significant career uh, decision who can influence who gets hired, has that person ever blown the interview, misjudged a candidate? Has that ever happened? Where a good candidate got excluded because of some silly reason, uh, too tall, too short, a little bit nervous, whatever. Didn't look exactly right, didn't have the right school. Has any of those things ever happened? I'm almost, I've been shown almost always, right? It happens all the time. Well, so now, so now I go back to my background. My background was in manufacturing, manufacturing aerospace, manufacturing high tech. It was in the first handheld consumer electronics business, manufacturing automotive parts, big high scale axles, brakes, transmissions, and as well as automotive accessories. So my whole background has been in manufacturing. And the big thing to manufacturing is yield. Well, so now I get into, and so you build business processes to minimize, you know, maximize yield, minimize scrap. Well, as far as I was concerned, having a good person not get the job meant I had to do the search over again. So I said, you know, I've got to become a good interviewer. It literally took me five years. I was not a good interviewer to begin with. I became relentless. I, at the same time, also gave a one-year guarantee. But I got evidence. That became our performance-based interview. I do not lose candidates anymore because somebody blew the interview. We train hiring managers around that. Uh, we train recruiters around that process. You have to have evidence to prove your candidate's good, even if they don't make the greatest first impression, even if they're a little bit nervous. But if they're hot performers, you've got to present them. And if they can meet the performance requirements of the job, you've got to present them. If they're passive candidates, you've got to present them. Uh, and you've got to close the deal. And I guarantee you'd say yes to this. Do you ever lose people because not enough money in the budget? Ever lose people because there's not enough money in the budget?
you got to be with me here. Yeah, sometimes we do. I'm going to say you lose a lot of them because you didn't even talk to them at the beginning. Person, you had 110 in the budget and they want 130, said, sorry, I can't pursue it. We're going to talk about that, Sean. Good question. I think that's an excellent question. So let me kind of show you how to do it. So let's kind of, uh, here's my philosophy though. So let's assume I was calling Sean. So let's assume I asked Sean, Sean, would you open to explore a situation that's clearly superior to what you're doing today? Sean says, yes. He said, well, what's the compensation? And I say, Sean, the comp it doesn't really matter what the compensation is if it's not a career move. Let's first see if it's a career move and then we'll figure out if the compensation works. Then Sean says, okay, what's a career move? I said, Sean, for this to be a career move, I have to give you a 30% increase. You know, that's okay, uh, but, but I say, but don't get too excited, Sean. It's not about money. It's about career growth. I've got to get 30, for this to be a career move, and if I can't figure it out in five or 10 minutes, career move's got to have job stretch, job growth, increased job impact, and a better mix of work you find more satisfying. That's going to take some time to do that. What I'd like to do is have a very short conversation to see if we're even in the game. I've got to, get, so my whole focus when I talk to candidates is to give them a career move based on this 30% solution. Therefore, I don't have to worry about the budget as much. What I try to do is the budget compensation is a negotiable item. I want to put it at the end of the process. But I start right away by telling people, hey, this decision's about uh, career growth, not about compensation max. We'll try to get you both, but the more important one is, and I'm going to give you a tool, uh, I think I'm going to give you a tool today on how to address that issue. Uh, well, we're going to get to that in a moment, Sean. Uh, we, I'm sure people will do this. I, I'm going to give you some ideas on how to do stuff. You don't have to, I mean, they'll be similar or different, but uh, we have a process that goes through every one of these steps. Uh, and here's the process I do. First, this is how I develop my sourcing strategy. If you're in a surplus situation, my goal is to first, uh, I want to understand where's my candidate. Is the candidate very passive, very active, or somewhere in between? I first cherry pick candidates to find out those who would find my job to be a career move. If I'm looking for a director, I probably want a senior manager. If I've got someone who's been in two or three years, I want to put them on faster growth. Uh, if someone's a VP, uh, if I can put them in a different kind of position, they might have been a VP or at a big com uh, small company, make them a director, but it's a different position. So I'm trying to find, before I even call them up, I'm looking for this 30%. I'm looking for that because I don't want to waste my time. But when you think about candidates on how they do things, they go on what I would call, I call this the career zone curve. That blue line represents the growth and impact over time of an individual candidate. Growth and impact is the height of the curve. Uh, as a, basically it says, hey, when a person just takes a job, they're highly satisfied. If the job doesn't change, uh, satisfaction starts to decline. If it starts going flat or starts declining slowly, they start kind of slowly looking at the clients fast, or they, just like this one fellow who we talked to the other day, his company uh, relocated. So he's out of work. Well, he becomes very active, no satisfaction, no future. Uh, each one of those categories represents a career opportunity or a career zone. Typically, when there's high growth and nice future and high satisfaction, they're super passive. Explorers are in zone two. Hey, uh, satisfaction has declined, growth has declined a little bit, they're not proactively looking, but if I call them up and ask them, hey, would you be open to explore something if it was better than what you're doing today, 100% say yes. Tiptoers are those who see the flattening or the growth, not they didn't get a promotion, so things are okay, they don't have to leave, but they start networking with, uh, they start looking for jobs when they're very narrow network, and then they expand their search, they're very active. Oh, I call that zone four. We did some research uh, with, in a surplus situation, 20 or so percent are super passive, 43 percent explorers. This is 20,000 people who are fully employed. 13 percent tiptoers, 23 percent active. Fully employed people in a surplus for all jobs, including surpluses uh, and uh, scarce jobs. In a, well, then we went through and said, okay, let's cherry pick within that 20,000. Let's pick the more high demand jobs, managers and directors and STEM-based jobs. Only 5 percent of those uh, indicated they were very active. We asked people, uh, what's your job hunting status? What's your job? 5% um, of high demand jobs were active, 20% were tiptoers, 50% were explorers, 25% super passive. So it's interesting. 
uh, just kind of breaking out the narrow. However, to go after super passive people, you better have an extraordinary job. To go after the explorers has to be significant. You've got to just slow the rate of growth or increase the rate of uh, satisfaction. Tiptoers starting to look, they need a much better job, at least the top 25%, and they just need, uh, the very active need a somewhat better job. This leads to what I call my 2020, my, excuse me, my 40-40-20 sourcing plan. 40% on networking to get the super passives and the explorers, 40% on direct sourcing, email, Boolean, and 20% on very creative advertising. So this is kind of where we're going here. It sets my strategy up. Uh, yeah, I've used this, Sean says the, grass is, the graph is accurate. I've been using this graph since my first job well, my first management job, which is when most of you, none of you were born, when I had my first managed job, I'm absolutely you guarantee that. I was a manager of financial capital budgeting for a big automotive company, making truck axles and brakes and stuff like that worldwide, 15 plants around the world. Um, and I was, three days after becoming a manager, I was put on the MBA corporate recruitment program, and uh, we were competing with the IBM, and this graph was a way to say, hey, at our company, even though you're making axles, you'll be on a better curve. Uh, faster curve. So I've been using it for 40 years. It's still true today. Uh, but it does set the strategy for us. Uh, so here's what I want to say. Now I want to kind of lay the stage here and uh, kind of see if we can get into some practical aspects of the, the program here. When you think about it, there are two talent markets. One market that has, and I'm going to say it, maybe it's a total 15 to 20 percent or 5 to 20 percent in size. These are the active candidates. And they tend to turn over a lot. They look for jobs a little bit differently. They turn over a lot. Uh, and you'll, but then they have the other market, which is you know, 80 to 90, 95 percent, which are truly passive candidates. And again, I go back to if you have to implement a, if you want to go after the 80 to 95 percent passive, you have to implement a scarcity strategy to get to top 25 percent. It's silly. If you're going with the passive candidates, go after the best of the passive candidates. The difference is, in a surplus situation, you weed out the weak. In a scarcity strategy, you attract the best. Surplus is transactional. Scarcity is, if I'm only going after 20 to 25 people, it's consultative. I've got to convince the Shawns of the world that this job really does offer me a 30% increase. That doesn't happen overnight. It takes hours, but over weeks to do it. My first conversation is I've got to get them in the conversation. Uh, I don't even screen people on skills and experience. I screen them on performance. Hey, can this person do this job? I don't advertise ill-defined jobs. I advertise career opportunities. Hey, this is pretty compelling. I'm, not, I'm less focused on cost and efficiency and more focused on ROI and quality. It turns out the, same, the process, however, I can be just as efficient and just as costly by focusing on fewer people and spending more time with fewer people. So I get all the benefits of the active, but I also get this bigger benefit, which is I'm going after the top 25%. I presented this concept to a group of, they're hiring 15 engineers. They said, Lou, we'll give you all 15 engineering assignments, and this is where I'm starting to merge our activities with some uh, search, search firms, is we'll take all 15, we're going to charge you the same as a search firm would, but we're going to get to the top 25%, and we're going to train all your managers in performance-based hiring. They said, let's go for it. We're already training the managers. We're now building the search process up next week. CEO, CEO, as soon as he went through the class, he said, we've got to do it. 25 of his senior managers, every senior manager, every director, every VP, the COO and the president were in the company, not a huge company. At the end of the program, I said, do you want to implement performance-based hiring? They stood up and applauded. At that moment, they took them, let's take our open jobs, take them off the market because they're boring. It's just interesting when you get with hiring managers, they agree to do it because it's logical. It's not a transaction. It's not speed and efficiency. It's, hey, let's spend more time with fewer people who are great and convince them this is a great job. And you think about all the referrals you had. That's what happens. I worked with Lionel three years ago. I haven't really, but Lionel, I got the spot for senior manager spot. I think it could be up your alley. Does it make sense to even talk? They said, well, Lou, I'm kind of happy, but yeah, I'll have breakfast with you. So if, if I had worked with Lionel before, that's the kind of conversations you have. Let's just see how it goes. So I said, why don't we do that with strangers too? See how it goes. Let's have a conversation. Uh, so this is the metaphor I want to, and this is, if I just leave this metaphor with you, you'll understand where we're going. You know, Jim Collins has this thing about put the best people on the bus. Well, it depends on what bus you're driving. Most, most companies drive a metro bus. Hey, 
why not? You can come on our bus. Here's the salary. Here's where we're going. Here's the destination. Uh, here's the stop we're taking. No, I'm not going there. Okay, fine. Get off the bus. So, yeah, I am going there. Or you can have a tour bus. And I say, hey, Lionel, let's just go for a ride. I'm going to sell the drive, not the destination. I don't hope a good person gets on a bus. I've identified the good person. There were Lily, there were Lionel, there was Sean. I got to get them on the bus. And that's what I wanted. That's passive recruiting at the top of the funnel. Finding of their names is the good person. And I, sourcing is critical. But it's not a lot of sourcing. It's narrowing it down to get people who would find this job as a career move. Then I got to get them on the bus and I've got to recruit them. And it's going to be a couple of bus rides here to go from A to B or A to Z. It's not going from it's probably A to B to Z to F to G and then A back to F again. Well, I'll go for a bus ride if I have to. Uh, but it really is a different approach. I don't hope a good person gets on a bus. I put them on the bus. That's a different philosophy of recruiting at the top of the funnel. Uh, okay, so Lori, I haven't seen well, Lori has a question about have the percentages changed. I constantly update this and we update it for, for ages and all those kind of things. I think what I've seen happen is that because there's less loyalty with a company, they can find growth more easily. And if you ask millennials where they have found jobs, it's because they keep on working with a group of the same people at company A, company B, company C. Uh, and they achieve Q pretty quickly. And I, you know, so I, I don't think human nature has changed. Uh, you look for people who are 35 and older, they tend to have less turnover, uh, but they still can be convinced that the job makes a career move. And I want to kind of address some of those issues. Uh, but I, I want to kind of raise the point here of the value of your connectedness. And when I look at LinkedIn, is that I, let, me ask, let me ask you this question. Two years ago, if I sent out, and I write great emails, we have, if you go to our class, if, you've been to some, if, you've ever, if any of you have been to our class, you know we spend a lot of time on coming up with creative emails. We give you tools to do it, our ad wizard, creative. Two years ago, our goal was, hey, just by being somewhat creative, you can get 35%. If you're really aggressive, you can get 50 to 60, 70%. My goal was 70% return rates on an outbound email and persistence. Well, now I'm working, I've got to almost triple my effort to get to that. My, just a simple thing, if I get 5%, the 10% with the creative email, I'm happy. So I've actually noticed, now this not, this is a small sample, I can't be true, I've noticed the response rates have dropped pretty dramatically, and I have to get much more aggressive. Have the response rates on LinkedIn emails drop reasonably from your perspective if you don't have an employer brand? This is very uh, anecdotal, so seems to me I'm working a lot harder to get, in fact, we got a whole strategy meeting this afternoon of how do we triple our response rates from where we are, just not satisfied with them. So we come up with some creative techniques, texting, chat box, uh, the whole thing, neither here nor there. Uh, but I want you to do the, here's what I got to, when you think about your, if you look at LinkedIn as a network of 435 million people, meaning they're all interconnected and every one of you has connections and I have connections and we're all interconnected somehow as opposed to a database of 430 million people, how you recruit them changes. First off, we have our first degree connections. If they're reasonable and you know them, uh, you can co contact them and 100% of them should call you back right away. You know, if you're cherry picking, don't just abuse them, but, uh, but they're your, and you know, they're your acquaintances. Uh, and in the olden days, I had a Rolodex of CPAs and manufacturing people that was pretty extensive. I called them up, I could pretty much get, uh, every 100% to call me back and they, I, because I knew how to get referrals, I could get some pretty hot quality referrals. And by mentioning the name of the referral, they'd usually call me back and I only called people back who were a high quality. Uh, so I would proactive, you know, I'd ask who is the best person you know doing supply chain management uh, using SAP platform. They were not looking at that, I don't care if they're looking at it, just give me their name and I would get names. So I tended to only work with first and second degree acquaintances. Uh, first degree direct acquaintance, second degree referral. Uh, then you look at LinkedIn, you got a bunch of strangers and you have to cold call them and you have to pester them, but it's not as effective. So I kind of want to just make a statement here. Just put in chat as quickly as you possibly can, but don't do it until I tell you I want three things. Put in the best person you've ever worked with, 
the best person, I don't care if they're looking or not, if they're your boss, or your, the best hiring manager, your best candidate you've ever placed, the best person you ever worked with, put their initials or first name, uh, their title, and why they're the best. Just put that in chat very quickly. Best person whom you know uh, in any field, but put their title and why. 30 seconds. You're going to ask this question uh, the next time you're talking to a candidate. That's why I want you to do it the same way. Same way. Quickly as you can. Doesn't have to be accurate, but just think about a great person, uh, title, and why. Why? They'll put the why. Three things. Name, title, why. Name, title, why. Name, title, why. Why? Great. I know they're great. <laughs> Care. Uh, thank you. So what would be a personality thing? Because they're friendly, it means they're incompetent, but friendly. So I just, neither here nor there. Uh, and I think somebody said hardest worker, and you got it. Okay, yeah. now I want to ask you another question, yes or no. Would the person call me back and just have at least a open discussion if I mention your name? Okay, so here's the issue. I asked Bay, would the person call me back if I mention your name? The point is, I only call people who would call me back. I also only call people who are good for my job. What's the point of, so this is when I say, when I do my sourcing, I, check, I don't talk to a lot of people. I talk to a few people. As I mentioned this concept to a guy who was big in sales, he said, John Barrow, and I'll find his name if anybody reminds me. I think it's B-A-R-O-W, but that might not be exactly how it's spelled. John Barrow has a sales course on training salespeople to not look at a lot of people. Spend all of your lead generation finding people who would absolutely want to buy your product. Do your needs analysis ahead of time and then aggressively go after to get 50 to 60 percent of those people. Uh, so very, very selective of whom you go after. Most recruiters go after a lot of people. So when I was mentioning this, there was a bunch of salespeople said, that's exactly what this guy said. Never thought about doing it for recruiting. Uh, so Sean's doing the same thing. But here's the reason. Uh, they call you back. Acquaintances call you back. I had one can for this search assignment. I told you I have a search assignment for this director of lead generation. Well, there's one person I would work with in New York who is a woman. She's a world-class woman. I lost track of her for a few years. I found her an hour and a half after I got the search. I said, I wonder if Margaret would be interested in this. So I looked her up on LinkedIn, lost track of her three years ago. I said, Margaret, I know what you're doing, but I got the spot. I said, Lou, great to talk to you. We just had a nice conversation. Hey, you know, I really would like to go back to New York City. This is pretty cool. Yes, let's talk. So I got her. Um, she, she and I are going to be talking tomorrow. The point is, acquaintances call you back almost at the rate of 100 percent. Almost at the rate of 100 percent. I didn't call this person unless I knew she was good. I already knew she was an A-level person. wasn't sure if her background in the last three years was appropriate, but she is managing a pretty significant team. I said, oh, she could be in the game. I knew she was an A-level person. My client will hire her if I can get him in the client for some other position. Uh, but when we call people, we have to be very, very selective. And I spend more time being selective than I do. I don't, I'm not worried about efficiency. I'm worried about being selective because I already know they're good. And then I ask the yes question, which is the killer. From this moment forward, guys, this is the first thing you'll ever ask a candidate at the top of the funnel. Would you be open to explore a situation if it were clearly superior to what you're doing today? What percent of the people do you think would say yes to that? Hey, would you be open to explore a situation that was clearly superior to what you're doing today? What percent would say yes? It's actually 75% of the super passive, 100% of everybody else. Everybody says it. Then they say, well, what's the money? I said, the money doesn't matter. It's what uh, the career move. And they say, what's the career move? I said, I give you 30%. 75% of the passive people, super passive, still talk to you. Uh, so it's the idea, particularly if they got referred by somebody they know. What I like to do is recruit people first before I network them, because then I get to know them. And that's really the issue I want. Obviously, not everybody I call, but if I call people who are A-level people and I engage with them, then I can connect with them on LinkedIn and search on their connections. That's what we do in our class. How do you get these people to call you back, and how do you search on their connections? If you can get 10 great names, eight of them will call you back, Probably two of those would probably be final candidates, but six of them are going to give you two other names. So now you've got 18 names. So you don't have to, that's about getting networking referrals, that's the game. Yeah, and I think, Sean, it's about building, 
but it's building relationships of people you want to build relationships with who either know your candidate who are your candidate and who are in the A-level class. I only like to deal with A-level people. I, not, I don't need to talk to anybody who's not going to get hired. No reason. That's a waste of time. I do not, and I focus on not wasting my time when I take a search assignment. So here's now. Here's the key, though, to pull this off, to create the 30%. To get the person that is a career move, I've got to know the job and I've got to get the hiring manager to, this is a question on hiring managers. If I can't get the hiring manager to agree to this, it all falls apart. All falls apart. So now I'm going to go back to my first, my first, my first search assignment. The day I became a recruiter, I had, the week before I became a recruiter, I was running a company with 300 people. I was on a good track. I was almost. I was offered the general manager, uh, president, or senior vice president of another division. That was. They didn't want me to leave. I hated the group president, though. I hated the guy. I mean, it's 40 years. I still don't like the guy. I would have stayed there. But rec these recruiters I was using had a great life. They were, I was working 80 hours a week. They were working 40. They were making five times as much money as I was. I said I got to be a recruiter, and I was doing okay. But the first job I had, because I was in the automotive industry, as I knew a president of a company, was making hot rod wheels. And he, I, he, I just called him up before I said, hey, Mike, I'm going to do this. He, he thought it was stupid, too. I said, probably is. But he said, well, if you become it, I'm looking for a plant manager. So the second day I became a recruiter, I already had that one assignment. Didn't use the job description. I said, let's walk through your plant. I had no problem walking through the plant. Big, giant chrome line, probably 50,000 square foot manufacturing facility. Walked through every part of the facility. The chrome line was dirty. I said, Mike, this is junk. You got, you're producing crap here. We've got to fix this up. Uh, why do you have raw material next to finished goods here? That's, we got to relocate. We got to realign this whole plant here. How are you tracking this stuff? Where's your labor performance? Why do you got 48 people sitting over here doing nothing? Three purple grinding and uh, shining equipment. You got 47 people sitting around playing with them thumbs. Walk through the plant. 45 minutes later, I'll find a plant manager who can fix that. Three weeks later, I made a placement. I have never, ever, ever once used a job description listing skills. I always ask. Well, first off, having those skills doesn't mean the person's going to achieve Q. I said, what would the person need to do to be a top performer? And every single job in the world is just what I did. I walked through the plant. I looked at financial statements. I looked at marketing. Hey, you got to launch a product. You've got to build, design a circuit. Then I asked a manager. I remember this. I was at Broadcom. It was, and I know Broadcom. Well, I found out later that's what they were doing it for. Broadcom was making the first iPhone chip. And in the job posting, it said, must have 10 years experience to do all the state-of-the-art stuff. They didn't tell me what the company was at the time, so it was pretty hush-hush. But nonetheless, I said, well, this job description is probably the one you're looking at. Direct senior director of engineering. What if I had a five-year person who was brilliant and could design a chip to do all, the, do all this stuff? Would you even want to see him? He said, I'll hire him this afternoon. I said, you never will because said, you must have 10 years' experience. Why don't you define the design of the chip as being the requirement? What do you mean? I said, yes, you need a person to design a chip that can perform these kind of characteristics and this kind of level of thing, and I've got to get it done in six months. That's what you should advertise. That's going to excite people. And prove if they can do design that chip, that becomes a criteria for success, not the 10 years. Every single company that does it hires better people by focusing on what the person needs to do. And when they see what they can do, that's the challenge. Why would a top person want this job? If you're not an employer of choice or a great employer brand, you've got to prove it in your job descriptions, the employee value proposition, what they can do and become. This is how you reverse. This is the strategy. Let's define work based on what the person can do and become, not with the skills they have. The proof is they've got to be able to do it. I won't compromise on the work. They have to do the work. They've got to design a circuit. Perfectly fine with that. If they can't design a circuit, they don't deserve the job. But if they can do that, we're in the game. And then when I talk to somebody, let's assume it's Aaron. Aaron's a circuit designer. I've got to get you 30%. I got to get you 30%. Now I got you in the game. I got you in the first, almost on the bus. What's the career move? Let's not. Uh, I got to get you 30% in terms of job stretch, job impact, job satisfaction, and job growth. And what I do is I use the, the bus ride to figure out where this candidate is in their current job. That's the lower part of this curve. Then I say, Hey, Aaron, I think I think we might have 30% here. I think the job's a little bit bigger. We got two or three people more in the department. The impact is clear. I mean, you're going to be driving, uh, the, you're going to be leading the whole launch of the whole new product line. It appears that we're going to be doing a lot more 
of the work you like to do, which is competitive analysis and dealing with managing and developing people, and it's clear that you've been growing 3 to 5% a year, you're going to be on a rocket ship on this one. At the time, Sean, Broadcom was a training client. So Broadcom was uh, a company we trained at the, 10 years ago. You could not hire anybody at Broadcom unless you went through our performance-based hiring methodology and program. Uh, so that's how I did it. Uh, now uh, I got out of recruiting. Now we're actually forming partnerships with recruiters around the world uh, because we see that our clients not only want fulfillment, they also want the training. So it's actually a unique differentiator for search firms. Uh, but the idea is this. So we train now. You don't have to be an official partner in our recruiting boot camp. We go through all this so you can still use performance-based hiring as part of your everyday search, whether you're a corporate recruiter or staffing recruiter but it does differentiate the world. It does allow you to achieve Q. Uh, I'm going to skip this part. I want to kind of, so let me kind of do this. Here's just the job posting, and then I want to just open it up. We have a few minutes. I just want to ask, answer any other questions we have here. Uh, this is actual real search I did do. We combined it with a client that was doing it. It was a huge search. I don't know, it was a huge search, a big search, certainly 200K plus search. Uh, for a VPHR in a terrible, terrible, terrible location. Now this one I got like, I did on LinkedIn probably three years ago, found 25 people on LinkedIn who I thought were, who would see the job even though it was a terrible location. It was in the Midwest, that nobody, there was nobody within 100 miles, 50 miles. But I found 25 people and I made this and I got every single candidate. I got 80, just sent the email out twice and I got, I think 80 people talked, 80% of the people talked to me. Why did this work? It's a true story too. I mean literally I was talking to the CEO. He told me what he wanted the person to do. I just captured his pain. Um, yeah, that's what it is. It's a story. You see any skills there? You see a single skill? Not one skill. person that they can't do this Number one, if they can do this work, of course they have the skills. Why don't they have to keep, why don't they have to put skills in there? If they have never done it, they don't have the skills. So it's not about skills, it's about doing this work. And I offered them a seat at your strategic table. And people who could see that this was a company that was a three to hundred million dollar company, was doubling about 500, 600 million in three years, hot company, terrible location, put a great person in. We got them off this posting. But this is part of it. Now the thing is, it's a campaign response rate. I just, uh, the, I, we can create the emails, but um, I, mean, I had one person who responded to an email we sent out Tuesday night, love your email, not looking, but I'm talking with her this afternoon and she's gonna give me some referrals. But I got it, I just, people aren't even opening the emails in LinkedIn, which I find, and I got LinkedIn recruited, they're not even opening up. Uh, some of them are giving me their phones, some of them are giving me their email, not giving me their, I'll put them in their list, so we're trying, and I'm using other outside resources to get their names and phone numbers uh, and email addresses. I just have to, our goal is I will, we will use a campaign, grow the marketing to get in touch with them. I'm not going to go, I've identified 30 or so people I know would find my job a career move, and if I don't, i got to just recruit them. So I, I see recruiting without, and talking with them is easy. Once I get them on the phone, that's easy. Getting them on the phone is what I, uh, the big challenge we have here. Uh, but I'm emphasizing learning, doing, and becoming, not the skills. I'm telling a story, true story. And I'm not, they don't have to apply. I just want to have a, I just want to put them on the bus. Let's have a conversation. So let me open it for now. Uh, so some of the questions you asked earlier uh, were critical. I want you to now ask me the questions, you same the questions you had or different or recruiting at the top of the funnel questions. I'll answer as many as I can. I can hang in there for five or ten minutes over time, but we certainly have a chance to do it. So type in your, your challenging recruiting questions again. And that, but I wanted to give you this context of what's going on there. Or JJ, was there any questions at the beginning I have to do? Oh, so I've got to, hey guys, we've got to stop at the top of the hour because we have another class that we're doing, a real class. <laughs> Sorry, JJ, I forgot. I thought you already had it. I didn't realize it was. Um, that's right, you did have two today, huh? Ooh, JJ's busy. <laughs> Were there any other questions that came in, JJ, earlier, though? Nobody seen? Um, yeah, I'm looking. I didn't notice any that came in other than the challenges that they put in this morning. 
Okay, let's well, okay. Did any of them come in there? Let me do the one with Sean about the money. Uh, first off, now this I think you're saying about a candidate who's over budget, a candidate who's over budget. So let me, and let me give you both scenarios. Let's assume that I have a candidate. You got a job's 120. The candidate's 140, and I'll just hate Sean. Uh, I think this job is. I, I can't afford you. Be real frank. However, I think this job really represents a career move. I'd like to have a conversation with you to see if it does. If it does, then you got to have a big decision to see if you can work within the money. One's going to be a short-term issue. One's going to be long-term. And I can't guarantee that I can meet your budget. What I can guarantee is you will know if you're going to have a sleepless night to see if you want to make the cut uh, with respect to uh, take a cut if the job's a career move. Now, I actually did that pitch with a guy who was making uh, not eight nine, I think he was making eight nine hundred thousand a year. This is ten years ago making that kind of money. Uh, I had a spot that was going to pay three to four hundred grand as CEO of a publicly traded company. The guy took the, he said, Lou, no, I want to be CEO of a publicly traded company. If I, that job gives it to me, it's worth considering. He got well. They went up. My client went up from four hundred to about six hundred. The board made the decision. He came down from nine hundred to six hundred. You know, and, and he did it. But that would be the way that I would do it. If, if let's assume that you were 140 and I thought you were great and the job was a career move, my client only wanted to pay, or the hiring manager only to pay 120. I'd say what I want to do, let's assume Lily's the hiring manager. Lily, I got this guy. I met, you, you met four people. They're all good people. This guy, Sean, is remarkable. He comes with a bigger price tag. Why don't you just talk to him on the phone? The idea is that, hey, you'll pay 120, 130 for these people, 140, 145 for this person. Uh, I just urge you to talk to him on the phone and benchmark this person's performance versus these other people. But just see where it goes. So the idea that I have is, number one, you, the candidate, have to see this job as a career move. It's not about the money. And the hiring manager has to see your ability to deliver uh, and you're a stronger candidate. So it's the combination of all, never focusing on the money. I'm always focusing on the performance. And everything I do is, and I can't do that unless I know the performance requirements of the job. And I see the job as a career move, and I see you as a person who can deliver those goods. So yes, everything is about those kinds of things. I don't think we have any more time. Uh, so let me just end this. And if we do, I'll send a message. Here's the. So first off, recruiting at the top of the funnel is a different process. It focuses on what people can do and become, not what they get. That's what performance-based hiring is all about. My focus is on networking with great people, few, a few great people, not a lot of average people hoping a good one stands. I've got to know the job and what the employee value proposition is. I've got to convert strangers into acquaintances, and it takes time. I can't focus on skills and experience. I've got to focus on performance. And when I get them on the bus, I've got to prove to them that my job's a career move. If I get to that, I got a chance to negotiate both sides. But I look at compensation as a negotiable variable, not a filtering variable. I'll say that again. Compensation is a negotiable variable, not a filtering variable. But if it's not a career move, it doesn't matter. I'm not even going to end the negotiation. So I always put that as the option. Guys, we have, you know, if you want to demonstrate this process, we'll, JJ will send you an email. Uh, if you're a business leader, if you are a business leader and a true business leader, you can audit our performance-based hiring workshop. It's next Friday, a week from tomorrow. Feel free to do it if you want to audit our hiring manager workshop. I think that's the first week in September. I'm not positive the exact date, but send us an email, info at Lou Abbott Group. Tell us you'd like to audit, and we'll get back to you. Hopefully this is great, guys. I wish you the best of luck as you hire great people. Hope to see you at boot camp. Be good, everybody. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Lou. Hey, Jack, you don't need them. You already got the surplus. You don't need any. Be good, guys. <laughs> thanks, Lou. And thanks, everyone everyone for joining us. You'll be receiving an email in your inbox in about an hour that kind of covers some of the um, the offers that Lou has on the screen here. So I'll uh, be looking for that and we look forward to seeing you at future other group webinars. Have a great afternoon everyone. Bye-bye.